and it's over. But as always is the case here in the Philippines, I have been treated with the utmost kindness and appreciation in this place. And I want to say thank you to Dr. Wells for his kindness to me and his friendship and generosity in allowing me to share in just a small portion of his ministry. And it's uh, simply by his invitation that I'm able to be here at all. And once again, I have the privilege of meeting another great pastor and his members here in the Philippines. And I want to say many thanks to all of you who made preparations for us, uh, drove us from place to place, prepared meals more than once. I stood right here and looked over at the kitchen area. I think some of those ladies were down there all day, every day, the last two days. I, I mean, they, they, every time I walk by, I see the same people down there working. And uh, I just want to say thank you so much. Uh, and I have tried to uh, meet a few of you and converse with you. And uh, I'm sorry that I won't get a chance to just meet everyone and speak to everyone, but I'm sure it's probably a blessing uh, to meet all of you and speak with all of you as I've been just to speak with the few people I've been able to meet. Brother Nobley, you've been uh, most kind, and I have felt well loved here in this place. And I just want to say on behalf of the IWWE team and the Soul Women Leadership Conference that all of us appreciate so much your kindness and love that you've expressed to us. And tonight, what I want to do is bring a message, number one, and share some things with you uh, that I think the Lord gave me, number two, and I want to be an encouragement to you. And I hope you'll just bear with me. I'm going to kind of give you the introduction and repeat the introduction and then give you some things around the introduction. But I hope when it's all said and done, it'll be a blessing and a help to you. So I'd like you to stand and look at Luke chapter 4 with me, please. Verse 24, Luke chapter 4 and verse 24. He said, Verily, I say unto you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. But I tell you the truth, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, when great famine was throughout all the land. But under none of them was Elijah sent, save Sarepta, the city of Zidon, unto a woman that was a widow. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elijah the prophet, and none of them was cleansed, save in Naaman the Syrian. And they all in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath, rose up and thrust him out of the city and led him under the brow of the hill whereon the city was built, that they might cast him down headlong. Lord, I brought this message in our church about five months ago, and uh, I reorganized it a little bit for tonight, and I have a lot of things written down. But what I'd like to have tonight, what I'd like to have tonight, Lord, is liberty and a direction from you to bring this message. And I pray that we will be able to inspire the people, encourage the people, and help the people of God tonight. So ask you to bless now, please, in Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. Now it has been said that the best commentary on the Bible is the Bible. If that is the case, then we need to pay attention to Luke chapter 4 because we have the Son of God commenting divinely on the work of God. So if the Bible is the best commentary on the Bible, then tonight what we have is Jesus taking two factual, divine events from the Old Testament and divinely placing his commentary on what God did in the Old Testament. So if the Bible is the best commentary on the Bible and we have the Son of God commenting on his word, put your antennas out, pay attention, because this is God speaking to us clearly and plainly from his word. Generally, it is a commentary of faith, and specifically, it's a commentary on what faith is and how faith works. And faith, at least in America, and maybe here, in the church, has become a mystical thing. In some churches or some religious circles, faith is a solve-all for every problem. 
it's a mystical power that removes negatives and removes all burdens and removes all challenges. But that's not what the Bible teaches us here in Luke chapter 4. In Hebrews 11, the great faith chapter of the New Testament, it's clearly stated that some of the best Christians that ever lived and some of the most worthy of God's servants lived in dens and caves, wore rags, and suffered at the hands of their persecutors. And yet if we're not careful today with all of our ministries on the media and the internet and television, we can hear some messages that tell us that faith is this mysterious solve-all. Once you get saved, there are no problems. Once you get saved, all your burdens are lifted. Once you get saved, there's never an issue. In fact, if you have any problems at all, you probably have a demon of doubt or a demon of fear or a demon of whatever. But tonight we have Jesus commenting on some very difficult times in the Old Testament. And we have him commenting on exactly how faith works and some of the dangers of faith. You hear what I said? Some of the dangers of faith. Jesus said first of all here in Luke 4, where you expect to find faith, you won't find it. Carefully, what does he say? Very, very clearly, he says in the Bible, God looked down on the nation of Israel that had the temple and had the prophets and had God's word, had Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, had Moses and the Red Sea and the, the pillar of cloud and fire, and he could find no faith. His own country, his own people, the land of his own nativity, his own history, he could find no faith. And so God lifted his eyes and looked, and he went to a strange land, a far off place, a place you wouldn't expect to find faith, and he found a widow lady who didn't have a prophet, and didn't have a Bible, and didn't have a temple, and she had such great faith that he sent the man of God, Elijah, to her to meet her needs. And I want to say to you tonight, number one, faith is often found where you don't expect to find it. And I want to say this, write this in your Bible. God will find faith wherever it is. If God can't find faith in America, he'll find it in the Philippines. If he can't find the Philippines, he'll find it in Turkey. If he can't find it in Turkey, he'll find it in China. If he can't find it in China, he'll find it in Russia. But bless God, God is looking for people who exercise faith. And if he can't find it where he thinks he'll find it, he'll look somewhere else. And where he finds faith, he's going to react. That's exactly what that tells us. Now, he went to the man of God, Elijah, shows up at Zarephath. Now, in your Bible, it's pronounced a different way. It's uh, Zerupta. That's a Greek pronunciation or spelling of the Old Testament Zarephath. But the unnamed widow lady is there. And she has nothing. And she's making her last meal with her son. And she's going to eat it and die. And Elijah shows up. And what is the first thing that he asks for? her last meal. Amen. Wow. And she has to sacrifice so that she can receive God's provision. And so she shows up and she says, what are you doing here, sir? And he says, well, God sent me here. In fact, God says he prepared a widow lady to take care of Elijah. And so she must have some faith because God wouldn't have sent Elijah there if she had some faith. And so she's expecting that he'll bring her a gift. She's expecting that he'll bring a big bag for her rice. But he doesn't bring anything. He asks for something. See, faith doesn't always work like we think it's going to work. We have this preconceived notion that when we pray and expect something from God, he's going to do it exactly the way we think he's going to do it. But he has his own way of doing things. And so she's expecting him to come in with a big wagon with rice and bananas. And uh, If it was me, I would have been expecting mangoes, okay? But anyway, that's, that's Karn's translation. But at any rate, she's expecting him to bring some stuff, and he brings nothing. And the first thing he does is he asks for food, and she doesn't have any food. This doesn't make any sense. We're supposed to pray and get all these things from heaven and just get all these blessings and have this spirit of abundance. And God says, faith isn't always that way. So she sacrifices and gives him a bite of her meal, and God blesses, and of course, for the next two and a half years, her cruise of oil and meal brings forth enough food 
for she and her son Elijah every day. But please, 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 listen to me now. This is Jesus commenting on God's work. This is the Son of God commenting on God's work. Her faith did not solve all of her problems. She was still poor. She still lived in heathen territory. She lived in Jezebel's hometown. You want to be living in a bad place? Live in Jezebel's hometown. You talk about the enemy of God. She was so bad when God killed her, the dogs ate her flesh, and there was almost nothing left of her body. That's a bad place to live. She still lived there. I mean, God came and sent a miracle. God responded to her faith. God sent a man of God to her. God met her need, but she was still poor. She was still a widow. She still lived in Zion. She had her son and she was alive. I'm trying to point out, according to Jesus, that faith didn't solve all of her problems. What's the next illustration? I'm going to repeat myself a little bit tonight. I hope I don't get confused. The next illustration is 2 Kings chapter 5, the story of Naaman. Boy, you talk about finding faith in a strange place. It's very clear from the story that Naaman was a conqueror of the nation of Israel. Naaman was one of those generals who had come to Israel and invaded the land and killed people and carried slaves and prisoners back to Syria. In fact, he had taken a little, a little slave girl, a little teenage girl, maybe a young adult from Israel, and she was working in his home as a servant, and he was a leper. And it's interesting, the Bible says that he was a great man. You know why? Because when he came, he, okay, he heard from this little girl about this great prophet in Israel named Elijah. And somehow God sparked faith in this Syrian general's heart. And when God could not find faith in the nation of Israel, in the place where the temple was, in the place where his word was written, in the place where his prophets lived, he lifted up his eyes and he looked and he said, over here among the conquerors of my people, I find a man with great faith. He's a leper and he believes he can be healed by Elijah. The story is so wonderful. Read what he brings with him. He brings six thousand talents of silver and ten thousand pieces of gold and ten changes of raiment. That's why the Bible says he was a great man. He was willing to pay for his medical services. He wasn't looking for a freebie. And in your Bible, notice that it says both in 2 Kings 5 and our text that we read that the leper was cleansed. You will find nowhere in the Bible where a leper is ever healed because leper is a type of sin. You can't get healed from sin. You have to be cleansed from sin. All right? So, let me stop here and give you the first part of the message and the second part of the message, and then we'll go on some more. I'm sorry if this is a little disjointed, okay? But the first part of the message is this. You don't always find faith where you expect to find faith. And if you can't find faith where you think you'll find faith, God says, okay, I thought I could find faith here, but I can't find it. Some look over here. Oh, wow, over here somebody has some faith. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to intercede. I'm going to interact. I'm going to uh, interpose my power. They have faith. So God finds faith where it is. Okay, here's the second part. <coughs> God responds to faith in two ways. One, he brings the man of God to the need, or two, he brings the need to the man of God. Right? In the first case, he brings the man of God to the widow lady. And in the second case, he brings the man with the leprosy to the man of God. So if you will exercise faith tonight, dear brother and sister in Christ, God's going to do one or two things for you. He's either going to bring someone into your life who will meet your need, or he's going to take you somewhere to meet someone who will meet your need. But it won't always be the same every time. Are you with me? All right, now this is where it gets a little touchy. Naaman the Syrian has enough faith to travel to Israel, enemy territory. So he shows up with all of his wealth because he's an honorable man and he's willing to pay for the medical services he's going to receive. <laughs> and his uh, king sends him to the king of Israel. Now, as in most cases, the government does not understand the church. Praise God. I mean, in America especially, the government does not understand the church. And so the leper shows up at the king's palace and says, Wow, I believe there's a great 
healing power of God here available in Israel, <coughs> my little servant girl told me, if I'd come over here and see you, Cain, you'd heal me. And the king said, oh, my goodness, the man's picking a fight. He's out of his mind. What does he think I am? He says, go away from me. And, Eli and, he, and Naaman gets word that he should go see this prophet, Elijah. Oh, stay with me. This is so good. This is our testimony sometimes. We have this preconceived idea of how it's going to go. What does the Bible say? He shows up at Elijah's house, and he thinks, quote, that the prophet shall come out and wave his hand over the place, strike his hand over the lentil, and heal the leper. He was comparing real faith in God to this false religion of Mishrach in his own country. And he was used to having the, the Mishrach service. Jesus, Jesus, whoa, whoa, Jesus. And he thought, he thought since he was the general and he had all his money and he had no faith and he's come to Israel that this big time preacher's going to come out and miraculously do something and lay hands on him and heal him and the man of God doesn't even come out of his house. He sends a servant out and says, hey dude, a boss man said you're supposed to go down Zipper in Jordan seven times. It'll all be good. Just go ahead and dip in Jordan. And Naaman, in the text, Naaman said, no! He says, that Jordan River is so dirty and horrible. He said, that's stupid. I don't want to dip in that river. The rivers of Syria have been in far are so much better. Why would I want to dip in that stupid river? What the hell? That's where you are, sir. Or you came to a BBC Cebu, or you came to Bethany Baptist, or you came to a big revival or a conference like this, and uh, you got saved, or you got called to preach, and you saw the choir, and you saw the quartet, and you saw the lights, and you saw the cameras, and you saw the sound system, and you surrendered to the ministry, and you thought that's what it's going to be, but it's after two years, it's 37 in Nephi. So you had this idea that just because you got saved and you got called to preach and you got the ministry that you don't have this big building and this big ministry and these lights and these cameras and all these singers and you've been sold and you've been reading the Bible and praying and you've been going to and there's 37 in the Nephi. And you're ready to turn around and go home, are you? Do you know sometimes when you really exercise faith, the person you have to contend with the most is you. Yeah, you. You've got your idea how it's going to be. You've got your idea what God should do. You've got your idea how you think God ought to do it. And you prayed about it and you saw God. See, it, Naaman had the faith to travel to enemy territory. He had the faith to believe he could be healed. But when it didn't go his way, he was ready to quit and go home. And he had to come to grips with reality and say, wait a minute, thank God for a servant that probably grabbed his coat and jerked on his coat and said, hey boss, wait a minute. If this guy asked you to go kill 20 people, you wouldn't hesitate. He said, how much more? I mean, he's going to ask you to do something really simple like dip in Jordan seven times. Boss, it's worth trying. He dips in Jordan. He dips in Jordan again, and he goes now the seventh time. When he comes up, his flesh is restored as a little child. Wow! Hey, you know what he found out? He found out that faith isn't always about what you think or what I think, but faith is about compliance, faith is about submission, and faith is about obedience. And God has a right to intervene in my life and your life the way he sees best. And sometimes it won't always be like we think it's supposed to be. Hello. So much for the outline. Do you know how I got in the ministry? I was great. I discovered America in 1959. Then I discovered Jesus in 1969, October 29th, 1969, when I was 10 years old. 
I went to a citywide revival, and I was an American Baptist back then and didn't know it. It was in the Presbyterian Church of all places. And in that little town in America, as is the case in many American towns, there's a church row. You know, they've got the Methodist church here, and then another block, it's a Presbyterian church, and across the streets, a Lutheran church, and down the streets, a Baptist church. Well, they had a lay preacher in there, a lay preacher in there named John D. Varner, and he was a real fiery preacher. He was actually an insurance salesman. He was preaching in this Presbyterian church, and my family went to church every Sunday and morning and evening and Wednesday night. So my father took the older of us five children this revival, and uh, on Wednesday night we were walking out of the church and down the alley, across the alley to the Baptist church where our car was parked, and I started crying and I said, Dad, I really need to go back in there because I think I need to be saved. He said, let's go back in there and you can get saved. And I said, well, let's come back Thursday night. So I was probably already saved Wednesday night, amen? I mean, I realized I needed Jesus, but technically Thursday night I went back. I went down the aisle. I cried. I went through the prayer. Mr. Charles E. Lynn led me to Christ. He was about 65, white hair, mustache, bald. I have a testament that he used to lead me to Christ in my home right now in my little drawer in my dresser. My mother bought it for me at his estate auction when he passed away. I went through the Billy Graham follow-up program in the mail, did about 10 lessons through the mail. When I got to be old enough to be out of high school, went off to New York City, got a four-year college degree, went to New York City, worked in fashion photography and graphic design. Let me tell you something, that's not a very good field for born-again believers, okay? So I had to get out of that. Well, in the process of all this, I'm a kind of a middle-of-the-road Christian and I realize I'm in trouble, and I realize I'm about to go off of a moral cliff here if I don't get this thing turned around. So I moved to Washington, D.C., and I started reading the Bible two hours a day. Now, you don't even have to be in that great of a church, but if you start reading the Bible two hours a day sincerely, I'm going to tell you what God's going to do. He's going to look down and say, this guy's exercised their faith, and I'm going to work with him. So I went to one church, and it kind of changed, and I left there, and I went to a little Baptist church, and that pastor was a great man, and I love him, but here's what happened. He didn't believe in standards. He didn't believe the King James Bible was the only Bible, and he didn't preach. He just kind of talked. Now, I didn't know how to win souls to Christ, but I'll tell you one thing. You're going to burn in hell if you don't get saved, all right? And I knew how to do that. I knew how to give you a check and say, if you don't get saved, you're going to hell. I didn't know how to lead someone to Christ, but I was full of this thing of, Jesus and the Bible and salvation, and I was in his church and I was causing trouble. Because I was excited. This is the honest truth. He says to me, he says, Sam, could I talk to you? I said, sure. This is a good illustration. He says, there's a guy in hand in the air named Jack Hiles, and he said, I don't like him. He said, in fact, he's not my kind of guy, but he's your kind of guy. He says, I think you like Jack Hiles. And he says, he has a Bible conference every March. And he said, I think you and your wife really need to go. Man, I, I, I was open to pastoral leadership. I mean, if my pastor said that I was supposed to go see Jack Kyles, whoever that is, I'm gone. So I saved a few dollars, and I got my own car, and my wife and I drove about 12 hours to hand in the end. And we got there on a Saturday night. Of course, it was snowing. Sunday morning, we went in. I'm sitting in Sunday school and Dr. Jack Howells just starts firing it up on the book of James and the wrong crowd and separation and I'm sitting there saying, wow, this is great. They had a tour of the college on Sunday afternoon and I didn't get very far into that tour and I was asking somebody, where do you sign up for this place? They said, well, Sam, you can't sign up today. This is just a tour. You've got to come back on Monday. I went home the third week of March and by June 3rd, I was, a, I was a summer student at Howells Anderson College. Wait a minute now. As I spent my time there and talked to this brother and this brother and this brother, what I found out was there were a lot of men there that came from churches that didn't really like Jack Hiles. But they were men who got saved in the military and started to really walk with God. And God looked down and saw they had some serious faith that they would serve, that they would sacrifice, that they would go through what it took to be trained. And they came from the most unlikely churches, 
to Howells Anderson College in Hammond, Indiana. And I said, well, what church did you go to? Well, I know that church isn't a very good church. Yeah, our pastor. But he said, I'll tell you one thing. So I got saved. He said, I read the Bible through in three months. He said, then I started reading again. He said, God dealt with me. He said, I went and heard Dr. Howells over here at some conference. He said, I, and what I'm saying is this. God will find faith wherever it is. Yeah. If God looks down in a likely place and then he can't find faith there, he'll find it somewhere where it's unlikely. He'll find it. And when God finds faith, he responds in two ways. One, he brings somebody to your need. Or two, he brings you to the person who can help you with your need. Yeah. Praise God. It's more fun without the outline. <laughs> Pastor, do you need to give up on the church tonight? I mean, you exercise some faith. You got saved, you went to church, you got faithful, you went to some conferences. God called you to preach, you surrendered. But it hasn't gone like you thought it would. Does God see any faith in your church? Does God look down and see you on your face begging him to help you? Does he, look, does he see you saying, okay, things aren't working out like I planned. I know I'm struggling. I'm going to get in the Bible in a new and fresh way. I'm going to take some extra time, pray harder. I mean, God will respond to faith tonight. Is he, is he finding any faith at your church, your ministry? Hey, sir, you don't need to give up on your marriage tonight. Oh, you got married all right. It didn't even go quite like you planned, did it? You don't need to give up on your marriage tonight. God will find faith where it is exercised. Has he seen you get on your face in regard to your husband and wife recently? Has he seen you take your wife by the hand and say, listen, we have some trouble with our children. Let's fall on our face. Let's get a hold of God. Let's pray about this. Bible college student, it's a challenge going to Bible college, isn't it? I mean, it's exciting when you first start. Then you run out of money partway through, or you get sick partway through, or you're... Your motorcycle, your, your, whatever you call it, your motorcycle blows up partway through, you lose your transportation. <laughs> we Baptists, you know, that's how God deals with us, through our transportation and our employment, because that's the only way we can get our attention. <laughs> you know, he breaks our car down, or he messes with our job, and it affects our income, or it affects our ability to make money. And when we work, you appreciate that, Brother Austin? When we weren't crying out to God and asking for help, he'll just mess with our car or a motorcycle or a job. And we're, oh, God, oh. You're going to have children, huh? Can I say this to you tonight? Having children and rearing children is two different universes. Especially in 2013. Having children is one universe, and rearing them for God is another universe. And you'll not raise your family for God if you don't have some serious faith. Because yeah. you're probably going to have to not only stand up to the world, you may well have to stand up to your own extended family. They may not appreciate your faith. God will see you and he'll say, okay, I'm looking down here to see if that. They're safe people, go to church, amen. They have any faith down there? God will be watching. One thing we know from the Bible, Jesus said, hey, I'm God's son, and I want to comment on this Old Testament passage here, these two miracles that my father did. And I want to tell you this, number one, God will find faith where it is. Hey, let me say this. God is not a respecter of persons. He's a respecter of spiritual character. He's going to find faith when it's exercised. He doesn't care. Okay. The nation of Israel fails to cross over Jordan two years after they leave the promised land. 
They decide that they made a mistake, the next day they want to cross, God says, no, it's 38 more years. Then, then, they destroy Moses with their mouth. They accuse him, they lie about him, they aggravate him, he loses his temper, and he misses out on his opportunity to go to the promised land. But thank God, he trained a young man named Joshua, and so now, we're at Deuteronomy, the second giving of the law, and, and, and Moses is repeating everything, and he hands it over to Joshua. Now Joshua knows that 38 years earlier, when the spies went over to the land of Canaan and came back and gave the evil report that things didn't go so well. But he's been told now that he's got a green light to cross the Jordan River, and he sends two young men over to check it out. Where'd they go, Pastor Nobby? Prostitute's house. <laughs> oh, where are God's people? God's people, where are they going to go in this new promised land to check out this promised land? City Hall? Cash and carry? The mall? No! They go to the prostitute's house. Why? Because this lady had faith. And can't you just see it now? They cross over the river, and they're kind of nervous, even though they, they believe God and have some faith, they cross over the river, and the, 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 they see this window, and they crawl up there, and they crawl in, and there's this lady standing there, and they're saying, boom. She says, come on in, fellas. They said, hey, bud, we might be in the wrong house. No, come on in. And these men are trying to kill them, and they're, they're not knowing what to do. And she says, listen, listen, I've heard about your God, and I believe in your God, and I want you to help me and my family. And I'm going to take you up on my roof, and I'm going to hide you under the flaps of, of roofing up there. And when these men are gone, then I want to talk to you because I believe in your God. So then the men went away, and they came down, and they talked with her, and they made that agreement. You know the agreement that she would be in the apartment or the house, and everybody in there would be safe. Okay, now stay with me. So these two guys go back across the Jordan River, and they go back to Joshua, and they go up to Joshua, and he says, okay, fellas, give me a report how to go. They said, man, we went and saw this prostitute over there. He says, say what? You went to a prostitute's house? What do you mean you went to a prostitute's house? No, wait, 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 let me explain to you. We went out there and went up in this window, and there was in this prostitute. But wait a minute, she's a good lady. She believes in God, and she has faith, and she's heard about God. Do you, you want to know what happened there? God looked down in a heathen reprobate place and he found somebody who had heard about the God of Israel and somebody who had faith and it was the most unlikely place. But God stayed true to his word and sent some men to the place where faith was unlikely. And God intervened in that lady's life. I don't know how messed up you are tonight, but if you're here tonight and you're really messed up, if you exercise some faith, God will intervene in your life. God will respond to faith where he finds it. And my Bible says that his eyes run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those who are showing some faith. So if it's tough in Bible college, the answer is not to quit is to show some faith. Obedience, compliance, submission. If your marriage is really struggling tonight, the answer is not to give it up, it's to show some faith. Obedience, compliance, submission. If your church has taken a downward turn, which that happens, we have splits and we have financial problems and all these things, okay, it's just not what you thought it would be. Guess what, sometimes faith isn't what we think it'll be. You don't need to leave your church tonight, Pastor. And you don't need to resign, probably. You need to get on your knees and exercise some faith. Your whole God. <laughs> our Lord does look on our hearts and He does respond when it's visible or evident that we're exercising some faith. And God's looking for faith. Faith is obedience to God, and faith may require sacrifice. Give me part of your last meal. Well, that doesn't make any sense, does it? I, I'm just sure in my heart that that widow lady 
I was expecting that preacher to come with a bag of rice and a bag of bananas and a bag of mangoes. He didn't bring anything. In fact, when he got there, he asked for something. And I just don't think she expected that. Faith may provide provisions, but not riches. Faith may provide the common stuff, but not luxury. Faith may cause you to travel, and faith may surprise you. And oh my goodness, faith may bring you into conflict with yourself. Let me say it again. Faith may bring you into conflict with yourself, just like Naaman. He expected a big service. He expected to be honored. He expected it to go a certain way. And the preacher didn't even look at his face. And he almost gave it up, didn't he? He almost walked away from a miracle of God. And that's what we do in the ministry. We surrender to it, and then when it gets tough, we pull back. My philosophy is the bigger they are, the harder they fall. That's how I like to roll, you know? When it, when it gets tough, the tough get going. Don't bury me. I may get in the flesh, but I'll find a way, I'll find a way to do it. <laughs> it's not the right thing sometimes, but I'd rather do that than quit. Give up. Turn back. Naaman was confused. He was confusing performance with power. You know, you're leading somebody to Christ, right? It's exciting. So where did Naaman go to church? The house of Misrock. <laughs> oh, brother, I lead John to Jesus, and Brother Wells calls me and goes, Brother, how you doing? Well, I'm good, Brother Wells. He goes, you led that guy to John. You led him to Christ last week. How's he doing? And he's going over to the house of Misrock. Isn't that where he went? I mean, you think every, every, you think everybody that gets saved and receives Jesus has to come to your church. Guess what? That ain't happening. Amen. That ain't happening. This man said, I am so committed to my decision. Would it be okay if I take two burdens of the earth, two mules laid with dirt, so when I go back to Syria, I can build an order to God, and I will worship the God of my salvation in my homeland. He was committed, but he couldn't walk away from his position as a bodyguard for the king. So he says to the preacher, you know, hey, listen, Elijah, do uh, you think you could let me slide? I'm not going to worship this god of Misrock anymore, but I have to go in there because my master is on my arm. I'm kind of his personal bodyguard, so I'm not going to worship him anymore, but I'm going to go back there with him. Do you think the Lord could pardon me in this? And I'll bet you old Elijah said with a big smile, yes, the Lord will pardon me of this. That's what it says in the, I hate to preach the Bible to you, but that's what it says. You just knew that those three people that got saved had to come to your church, and you know where they went? They went back to the church of their youth, maybe the Methodist church or Presbyterian church. And you were just sure that because you led them to Christ, they had to come to your church. But they do, because that's how faith works sometimes. And then if that happens and you maintain the right attitude, God sends in a couple of people that you never met. You never even saw them before. And they show up some Sunday and say, is this a King James Bible church? And you say, yes, it is. You have a soul winning program? Yes. Do you support world missions? Yes. We'll come to church here. And you don't have to fight with them to get them to tithe. And you have to train them for six months to give the world missions. They just come in and bring the Bible and sit down and start giving the tithes and offerings and giving the missions. And you're up front saying, you know, Lord, this doesn't work very well. Win these three people to Christ. They get baptized, go to some other church. And I'm thinking that my converts are supposed to be here, but they're not even here. And then this family shows up, and I've never even met them before, and I can't even take any credit to them. That's how faith works. It's not always going to go like you think it's going to go. 
may surprise you, might frustrate you, but you need to keep believing God anyway. Absolutely believe Him. Faith may force you to submit. Faith will most often go against the common and the usual. What am I doing here? 110 out in the country. I'm not in any national newspaper. I don't hold giant conferences. I have revivals at our church, but I, I don't travel and preach in Indonesia and Thailand and Asia. I just travel with Brother Wells. What am I doing here? I don't know. I shouldn't enjoy it. All I can say is that I never expected to do this, but through God's providence, I met Brother Wells, and he really stayed after me to travel, and I resisted for a few years, and then finally he said, you're going through Asia, now you, you get ready to go. And man, I'm so glad I did. I'm so glad I did. I don't even understand it. I, I, I wouldn't even be here for one for him. I just know the Lord, through my faith, has allowed me to have a part in his ministry, and when he gives me an opportunity to travel, I take it. I don't even understand it. I just enjoy it. It's a blessing. Faith will bring God to your house, to your life, to your church, to your trouble, to your problem. Is there any faith around your house? Pastor, God, see any real faith in your life tonight? You don't need to quit Bible college. You don't need to exercise. You don't need to, to run away from it. You need to exercise some faith. You don't need to run away from your marriage. You need to exercise some faith. Dear Pastor Brother, you don't need to resign your church. You need to exercise some faith. God's watching. God of heaven finds faith where it is. The most obscure places, the most obscure ministry, the most unusual situations. God's not a respecter of persons. He's a respecter of spiritual character. He's a respecter of faith. And I plead with you tonight, God has sent these men from IWWE to this meeting tonight to help you find a little more faith. Why don't you come to this altar tonight and say, Father, I'm here on my knees. And I'm going to exercise some faith and I need some help in this area, or with my ministry, or with my marriage, or with my college training. And I want you to look down tonight and see me exercising some faith. Father, bless us tonight. Thank you for the Bible. I was so blessed a few months ago when I read this passage in Luke, and I, I looked at it for the third or fourth time, and I said, wow, God finds faith where it is. And then I realized that in one case you brought the man of God to the lady, and in the other case you brought the man to the preacher. And then I went and read the stories, and I realized that faith is not always what we expect it to be, and it doesn't always go like we think it should go. And it may cause us to change our lives radically. It may bring us into conflict with ourselves. And I thought, wow, what a great insight that this is the Christian life. It's not always as we think it should be. I just know tonight, Father, that there are good people here struggling in their ministry or struggling personally or needing some tremendous help trying to finish Bible school. And dear God, tonight we need to refresh and renew, exercise some faith. And I pray your blessing help us tonight with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. I'm not going to put a big a plea out for you. I think the Bible is pretty clear tonight. But there are people in this room that you have difficulty tonight. And if you don't exercise some faith tonight, come this altar and start to get a hold of God, the problems you have tonight will be not workable in six months. And I encourage you tonight to stand with me as the music plays and come down this altar tonight and whatever you need is you express some faith to God. Lift up your face, lift up your hands, 
lift up your heart, lift up your voice and cry out to God. Tell him you need help. Tell him you need finances. Tell him you need some assistance in your marriage. Tell him you need him some you need some help with your pastorate, with your Bible college education. Please, please, please. Don't sit you wanna get married? Hey, you wanna get married? Marriage is a huge risk in 2013. You better be walking with God and pray God if you're gonna get married in 2013. I want the piano to play for us, please. Come on, Pastor. You're gonna struggle at your church, the problem at your church. You don't deal with it tonight, it's gonna wear you down. It's gonna wear you down. Tonight's the night to exercise faith. Seven or eight or nine people have been brought here by the Lord to try and bring some encouragement, bring some instruction. We're, we're not miracle workers, we're men of faith. We're trying to share our faith with you. Hey, dear lady, you're having a hard time in your life. You're facing some real difficulties. You can't solve it on your own. God wants you to call on Him. He wants you to make a connection with Him. If He sees you exercise some faith, He will respond. He will respond. Pastor Carnes, that's right, I, I, I surrendered the ministry and it didn't go like I thought it did. Well, you're, the, you're about the millionth person to feel that way. 